It's your boy Judea Black Shalom Line Purified Drink of Water. They got it is out there. Shouts out to the 12 tribes. I got it is right there. Um, okay, so we was talking about the uh, right field. So this is the beginning of the right field. And the only reason I'm calling them right field because we was talking about, I mean, right field, excuse me, because we were talking about the um, the being black in Israel. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to talk about some other stuff. And oh, and I know you heard my new, uh, that music I like is all slowed down and all. Uh, or top and screw type. I kind of like it like that for this whole little right field thing. So that's what that's going to be. It's like, make it your light, make it your low. Either way, go. It got a little soul in it. You know what I mean? So what I'm getting about this whole little right field thing is we're going to talk about um, uh, Emancipation Proclamation, Emmett Till. We're about to talk about the, um, hold on, I got the list of stuff right here. We're about to talk about the black codes. We're about to talk about the cold facts. We're about to talk about 40 acres in the mule, poverty, uh, special field order 15, objective eight and all that stuff. We're about to get into all of that with this right field thing. So that's what that is. And uh, like I said, um, you gonna stand for Israel, you gotta stand for Palestine. If you gonna stand for Palestine, you gotta stand for Israel because we support the people and not the cause. And I hope today found you safer than yesterday did. And I hope tomorrow finds you safer than today and the day before. Um, like I said, we inside today because we got to be, so that's just what it is. So we're running these right field things. So welcome to the right field. And, um, hey, I stopped. 20 something videos, man. This right field about the wrong one. So let's get straight into that. So I said I was going to do this like this. Uh, cue that music. I like it. I don't think twice. Just keep it out of my sight. Yeah. Well, bitch, don't kill my vibe. Bitch, don't kill my vibe. We are American privilege. Keep sparing my vision. Inherited sickness. Oh. Carolyn Bryant Dunham. The white woman who accused Emmett Till of making advances towards her has died. 14-year-old Emmett Till was kidnapped and brutally murdered by Brian's then-husband and his half-brother in Mississippi in 1955 over the allegation. The two men were acquitted in his killing by an all-white jury, but later confessed in an interview. The case gained national attention after Emmett Till's mother allowed Jet Magazine to take and publish photos of her son's mutilated body in an open casket. The horrific image shocked the nation and served as the catalyst for the civil rights movement. Years after Till's death, Dunham admitted to fabricating parts of her story, although she was never charged with a crime. Professor Davis Haupt joins us now. He's a professor of rhetorical studies at Florida State University, and he helped found the Emmett Till Memory Project. He also co-authored a book about the media response to Till's murder. Professor Haupt, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me on, Jim. Sure, I'd like to start uh, by asking you about sort of any interactions you had with the Bryant family. I did. Back in 2009, uh, word got out that the family was shopping a memoir. And I edited a book series with the University Press of Mississippi, and so I figured, why not? Uh, I wrote a note to the family. I had an address, and I sent it. And of course, I didn't figure I'd hear anything. Well. A week later, uh, I get a phone call from a woman who identifies herself as Marsha Bryant. Marsha Bryant is Carolyn Bryant's uh, daughter-in-law. And Marsha Bryant, first of all, wanted to know, you know, how did you know we had a, had a manuscript? And, uh, and then proceeded to talk my ear off for about a half an hour <laughs> about her mom being innocent. And, and the family's really never spoken. And so I just tried to keep her on the line, keep her talking. Uh, but I'll never forget how she signed off as we were as we were getting ready to hang up. Uh, she said, "You know, your your uh, your letter came in the mail, and another letter came in the mail with it, and in that letter was a death threat." And so, what I gathered from that was the family worked very hard over many years to protect her because I think those death threats were were not uncommon. All right. So Carolyn Brown herself hardly gave any interviews after the case, but. If we have this right, in 2008, she reportedly told a historian by the name of Tim Tyson that key parts of her testimony were not true. So how does all of that figure into what her daughter-in-law was telling you? And what do you make of it? Well, the FBI investigated Tim Tyson's claim that Carolyn Bryant supposedly recanted to him. 
and they did not find that evidence credible from Tim Tyson. And this summer, the, the memoir, the unpublished memoir leaked. And for me, what's interesting is in that memoir, she sticks exactly to the story she gave on the witness stand on September 22nd, 1955. So I take her at her word, and her word we know is 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 really just a bunch of lies. Uh, we know this because in, on September 2nd, just two days after Emmett's body was discovered, um, she uh, she was interviewed by a lawyer, and in that kind of deposition, she uh, she she indicates what happened in that store. Uh, and Emmett did not put his hands on her. He did not talk dirty to her. He did not talk fresh to her. He did not talk about being with white women before. Uh, and so those were lies that she concocted on the witness stand three weeks later. I, I just want to be clear about this, Professor. Never in the years after this did she ever express even a syllable of remorse, correct? Well, in her memoir, she does uh, do that, but she never did it in front of a camera. Um, she never did it in a, in a public venue. So you're right. Uh, we, the, the Emmett Till community, the family wanted to hear from her directly, but that never happened. All right, so the Bryant family obviously has had to live uh, connected to this with a legacy. Uh, I'm just curious, um, have any of the other generations said anything about this in the almost 70 years uh, since? They really haven't. They've kept a real tight lid on her story. What I'll be interested to see is in the days and weeks ahead, uh, did Carolyn Bryant perhaps leave instructions for somebody to talk? Uh, and we'll see. Um, we've long wanted the family to say something, but again, uh, the sons, the grandkids, nobody has said a word. It's so important, obviously, to continue to tell the story of what mm -hmm. happened. Uh, you have the Emory Till Memory Project uh, that you helped found to help do that. Can you just give us a little bit of mm -hmm. insight into what the Emmett Till Memory Project is all about? Yeah, I'm happy to. So we founded this project back in 2015. It was a joint project uh, between the University of Kansas, my colleague Dave Tell, uh, and Patrick Weems at the Emmett Till Interpretive Center and my colleagues here at Florida State. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to ed educate a new generation, uh, especially younger generations who are growing up on smartphones and who can go to the Mississippi Delta as well as Chicago and study the case from their phones. So it's a GPS enabled app that takes you from site to site and tells the story along with archival images as well as pretty detailed narratives of what happened at that particular location.